of especially Europe and North Africa and a little bit of the Middle East. We're going to be dealing with especially then the replacement peoples, these uh, Eastern barbarians as they sometimes might be called, <clears throat> that are going to come in and take over uh, most of Western Europe. And we're also going to talk about the surviving parcels of the Roman Empire, particularly uh, the medieval Christian church. So those are going to be our major topics. We're going to be dealing with a lot of culture and a lot of uh, discussions of societies as we go forward with this. This period is sometimes referred to as the Dark Ages, uh, not because of uh, any inherent sort of physical darkness. It's not like the sun quit shining or anything like that, but due to the lack of what we as historians refer to as, as a darkness due to the lack of written documentation. Uh, from this period. A lot of Romans, a lot of literature, a lot of uh, legal records, they're all going to disappear uh, from this period. And so it's hard for us in some cases to reconstruct this period uh, due to all of the historical darkness that takes place. So we have the fall of Rome. That happens, right? Rome is sacked a couple of times. And then we're going to have the rise of, as I see here, a question mark, right? Uh, Rome actually disintegrates. It isn't totally taken over by a foreign power. Uh, it falls apart and actually is going to go into several different pieces. We're going to see a number of these Germanic kingdoms are going to rise up and they're going to try to take its place. You'll see, for example, the Visigoths take Spain. The Vandals are going to get North Africa. The Ostrogoths are going to wind up with Italy. The Franks are going to get what is now Western Germany and most of France. The Angles and the Saxons will wind up with Britain. Uh, but what's going to happen is these kingdoms and these political units tend to break up and reform, uh, often leading to a great deal of political instability because they're formed more along social lines based on family, based on military conquest, and those are very fluid uh, multi-generational institutions rather than political instability, or rather than the political stability of saying, well, this is Rome. It's always going to be Rome until finally it gets broken up. These kingdoms, in some cases, just over the course of a couple of generations, they'll uh, conglomerate together and then they'll break up into component parts. So this map gives you a good idea of what we're talking about here. We have a great deal of pressure that actually causes a series of chain reactions from Central Asia to where uh, <coughs> pushing people uh, westward into uh, Eastern Europe and these guys in Eastern Europe are going to be pushing westward into what is then the Roman uh, Empire. The Eastern Roman Empire here in the Middle East and Southeastern Europe is going to survive but eventually all these guys break through the Roman frontiers. They're going to take over these huge areas with the, the Vandals uh, moving into uh, North Africa to give you an idea of the extent of this Roman collapse. Now, we don't have time to talk about all of these different uh, cultures and kingdoms, just you know, for the interest of time. So I pulled out the Franks to use as a case study to give you an idea of kind of what we're talking about as far as cultures go. And, and they are going to produce the longest lasting of the uh, kingdoms. But they also serve a pretty good... Um, case study to use because they're pretty indicative of most of the Germanic tribes in terms of their society and culture. The extended family actually plays the largest role, something that you and I might refer to as a clan or sort of a tribal kind of unit. Uh, it plays this huge role in society. They were considered units in terms of law, both in terms of criminal and in civil law. So whatever the local administration was, it was based on families and how they uh, coordinated with each other. And what there existed of a central government kind of recognized that authority. Now, the uh, religions were initially pagan amongst these people. They're of the um, old sort of uh, you know, Celtic, Germanic, Nordic, Teutonic traditions of paganism, right, until eventually they'll have conversions over to Christianity as the period goes forward. Now, their cultures were very interested in mimicking the Romans, right, and they wanted to incorporate these Roman styles uh, for what they had in terms of patterns of dress, their political and business connections, right, their education, and you'll see that of the surviving Romans, it was very much in their interest to intermarry their upper class uh, people with the upper class Germanics uh, of these Frankish kingdoms. And this, of course, ensured uh, success for both parties. The Franks are able to bring in many of these surviving Roman families into their ruling elite to give a great deal of sort of Roman legitimacy to what they were doing. And of course, the Romans, they're trying to survive, right? These, these people that are still of the, the Roman people. Uh, they're finding a way to integrate themselves into the new power structure uh, as well. Now these guys are pretty warlike. They're not interested in the wide-scale sort of urban trade that you would have seen in the Romans. So they have a very different idea of what wealth and power is. It was based more on what the Romans had of agricultural structures and land production rather than on urban centers and trade routes and things like that. So you're seeing an important cultural distinction there. You have the Franks. They love this, right? This is the, the horseback warrior as they're fighting against each other, right? Uh, and then, of course, we have our Franks today, right? So that makes us uh, kind of happy with these guys. 
Another interesting side note for us, those of us who speak English or Anglo-ish, right, the Anglo-Saxon invasion uh, of Britain, right? Uh, the Romans had pulled their legions uh, by the fifth century out of uh, the uh, provinces here of Britain. It was the furthest from the center of their empire. It was the least valuable, and so they pulled the legions out for the defense of the core of the empire, and that left these Britons relatively uh, uh, undefended. And so the Anglo-Saxons, these people who are going to invade Britain by water from kind of northwestern Germany, from you know, Anglia and from Saxony uh, in northwestern Germany, are going to start invading the island somewhere around 450 uh, AD or so. And these much more warlike uh, Germanic tribes are going to be largely successful here in driving out these Britons from southern and central England, and they'll set up the, uh, these various kingdoms on the island. Now, this is the period, for those of you who are interested in a little uh, quasi-mythology, where this King Arthur figure is going to figure into this, right? Uh, somebody from historical records is going to be of Roman descent and is going to gather up some of the remaining uh, Romano-Celtic, as Britain, um, and Christian forces in these various areas and going to wage a series of at least semi-successful wars on these Germanic invaders, right? You'll have a series of uh, victories somewhere probably in the neighborhood of 500 or 525 or so, uh, but then he would fall in battle, possibly to an internal civil war. You'll see that some of the early uh, literature on this fuses a very real guy, Aurelius Ambrosianus, with a very mythological guy, Arthur, into our sort of modern King Arthur figure. Uh, and, of course, a number of legends accrue about him, uh, this person who he was today. So this gives you a good idea of kind of where this area would have been uh, with uh, southern and central kind of England, uh, going over to the Anglo-Saxons and then much of the kind of the west country of Cornwall and Wales and then northward towards Scotland uh, still in Britannic hands. This gives you a good idea of uh, what these Anglo-Saxons would look like with kind of faceplate and masks. They're relatively lightly armored and armored, but they move very quickly. They have spears, they have helmets, uh, they have uh, little buckler kind of shields. And for the Britons who were largely kind of undefended, they were, they were hard to deal with uh, at this point. We think we know what Arthur uh, looked like. This is, of course... A uh, nearly accurate depiction of it from the film Monty Python and the Quest for the Holy Grail. So if you get a chance to watch that, be prepared to laugh. <clears throat> okay, so these are the people that are kind of coming in and taking the place of the Romans. But not all the Romans just drop dead, it's their government that, that falls apart, right? And so much of the surviving Roman power structure is not going to be preserved politically in a Roman state, but is going to be prefer, pre, uh, preserved in religious institutions of the Christian church, right? Well, the growing number of Christians throughout the latter period of the Roman Empire had required an ever-increasing number of strong administrative leaders. The way that this had evolved over time was the bishops over these cities had gained a great deal of power because they'd been plugged into the Roman administration. And then, of course, the bishops of these main cities of the Roman Empire, Rome, Alexandria, Jerusalem, and Antioch, they were held to be kind of in preeminence overall, especially in issues of theology. Now, there would be some early schisms in church doctrine, right? And as a result of that, the Roman state, which by the time you get to the 4th the, uh, uh, century is supposed to be Christian, right? The Roman state was increasingly called in to try to support what was true orthodoxy and what was heresy, right? And so they wanted to expunge these heretical views uh, from this. And so as you have the government playing a larger role in the church, we're also seeing then the church playing a larger role uh, with the government because as we're going to see in the latter part of the Roman Empire, uh, the Roman government is actually beginning to break down, and it is only the church structure that really begins to uh, hold itself together. Right? <clears throat> this is when we're going to get the birth of what people today would recognize as the papacy or the string of popes. Right? Initially, these guys were the, the bishops of Rome, right? and they began to assert what is called primacy within the church, the idea that the bishop of Rome is in fact the inheritor of Peter's uh, lineage of leadership of the church, and that they should then have a uh, primal say or final say as kind of a referee or umpire over all church doctrine. This was something that was actually a relatively new development uh, at the time that they began to introduce it, that especially the four main cities uh, of Christianity, they held themselves to be um, sort of above the rest but equal with each other, right? So the empire, as I mentioned, the pope uh, is declining in power. The, the power, the political power, the papacy actually begins to uh, rise. So the popes could enforce something that no barbarian invasion could effectively touch, and that is spiritual power. They didn't have armies, they didn't have navies, but they had the ability to gather resources essentially for church work and then also the ability to motivate people on an emotional level. Right? 
We have the first, the general first uh, is the, the one that we're going to regard as kind of the first of the, the, the modern popes. He's going to ride out, he's going to meet Attila the Hun. The Huns are invading Europe, they're headed towards uh, here into Italy, and he goes out to meet Attila and convinces him not to, not to sack Rome uh, here in the 5th century. When he rides back to Rome, regardless of whether he threatens Attila with like the, you know, the plagues of fire from heaven or not, um, he manages to convince him to leave, and so the, uh, Leo is hailed as kind of a, a great hero uh, from these people. And I love this uh, artist's portrait of this. Now remember, this is not a photograph, but you have Attila and the Huns, and they're all over here on the left, and it's darkness, and you can't even make these guys out. There's chaos. And on the other side, you have Leo, and you have the light and order, you know, a couple of angels flying overhead, and it looks like you know, Leo's just like with the power of his hand. He's forcing the Huns back. Some people say that actually Leo rode out and bribed Attila to go away. Some people say that, you know, Leo cursed the Huns with, a, with some kind of plague that forced them to, to go backwards. So I'll let your own sensibilities uh, sort that out. But it does give us a nice little interplay on, on what happens and the effects, they're not hard to figure out, right? The one who really solidifies the papacy as far as a political power is going to be Gregory, right? Sometimes referred to as Gregory uh, the Great. Catholic Church holds him to St. Gregory, right? Uh, so by the end of the 400s, the popes are really beginning to establish the spiritual power that they have over the emperors. Uh, as temporal power, whether you're talking about the conversion of the Germanic conquerors or the Byzantine emperors, the Roman emperors of the East that are continuing to go forward, right? Gregory's going to establish this papal power here for the Middle Ages and what it's going to be in terms of a political unit for a long, long time. This takes place during that attempted reconquest by the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Empire, and the Germanic tribes that had taken over uh, Italy. And this had caused such a great deal of devastation, especially in this kind of central swath of Italy, that it was a devastated kind of no man's land. And a lot of civilians are suffering from this. There's a lot of fighting. There's a lot of villages that are burned down. A lot of uh, you know, pigs and cattle and things like that that are slaughtered. Gregory's going to step in and seize these lands for direct church control and rule it much like a king. This is, of course, stemming from his view that, well, you know, charity demands that we step in for the humanitarian reasons, but this is also going to give a huge base of power in central Italy uh, directly to the church. He's also going to increase, his, uh, increase Rome's authority over the other Christian churches by ending these ecclesiastical conflicts. He's going to come in and say, hey, Rome, me, says this is how things are, and so since I'm the Pope, you guys got to do what I say, right? He's also going to begin the monastic and the missionary movements to get conversions to Christianity from many of these uh, still pagan people. You have one of these great scenes uh, here in uh, medieval Christianity, the crowning of a king uh, by the Pope, the establishment of, you have... Uh, temporal power, but it's God that has spiritual power uh, over you. Of course, it works the other way as well, because the monarch gets to say, hey, I'm in charge. How come? Well, God wants me to be. Pope with the crown on my head. So this is, on the one hand, a spiritual moment, but also it is fraught with political import. And there you can see Pope Gregory's got, he's got one hand on the Bible, and then he's got other stuff where he's working on as the administrator of the papal estates uh, here in central Italy, and he's going to be able to do both of those uh, interchangeably. While you and I today might see is mixing sort of church duties with uh, temporal state duties. Gregory nearly didn't have a problem with this, and other popes for a long, long time won't uh, either. <clears throat> As I mentioned, Gregory is going to start this monastic movement and then the missionary movement, and it takes a little bit for us to understand, you know, where monasticism comes from, right? The early Christian martyrs, these people that really had to put up with a lot of Roman persecution, they became great examples to other Christians for their faith. And then when Christianity is widely established, and in fact is essentially compulsory for a lot of people, that example really loses a lot of importance. You know, there's nobody that's being fed to lions or burned at the stake or you know, crucified upside down or anything like that. What's interesting is the method of conversion for a lot of the people in the empire had been rather top down. You come in, you say, hey, you guys should be Christians. You go, you convert the king. The king says, hey, I'm going to make all my people Christians. You ride out and you, you know, hey, we're great. We converted this whole country to Christianity. But in many times, they didn't really change their pagan lifestyles. And so a lot of Christians are looking at the fact that, hey, we're supposed to be Christians. Oh, yeah, we go to church, do the sign of the cross, holy water, we're good, we're Christians. But they don't really change the way they live their lives. A lot of people who are serious about Christianity found a lot of problems with that. And so many of these Christians would then try to extricate themselves from what they thought was a worldly existence and lead the life of essentially an ascetic hermit in these monasteries, these out of way places, to try to be pure uh, Christian faithful people, and then they would also work on helping others. They did church work as well, like transcribing holy texts, other works of history, monastic records, things like that. These guys do yeoman's work for preserving a lot of history for us historians a lot later. However, 
the popularity of this movement began to grow and attracted many other followers, and then even women began to join this, not in monasteries, but in nunneries as nuns. And so when you look at where these monasteries are, these rocks, you know, kind of out of the ocean, under the um, mountaintops, away from all these people, the idea that there's going to be separation to try to lead a pure, you know, Christian life, you'll only then go into the world to uh, try to uh, influence these people with works of charity. That's very much the, the physical world in which they live. So here are a couple of these ancient Christian ascetic hermits. There's St. Anthony, there's St. Simeon, who's sitting on top of a basalt pillar, uh, and uh, kind of off by themselves, and then people would come out and would ask them, you know, these Christian wisdom and things like that. So that's where the, the wise man on the mountain uh, motif that you find in uh, a lot of media comes from. And then there's St. Gildas, who is often credited with being the first to start the uh, nunnery movement for women, right? <clears throat> Christian missionaries at this point, it was a pretty dangerous gig. You go into some of these uh, pretty wild, barbaric pagan countries, and there was a good chance they were going to kill you in each of them. So Gregory is going to begin this policy really hardcore, sending out a lot of emissaries to try to uh, convert other people to Christian, uh, Christianity, especially the Germanic invaders that had taken over a large part of the, the, what had been the Roman Empire. As I mentioned, generally the way that he tried to do this was to convert the king and then let the king worry about converting the people. Some good examples of this, right? Patrick is going to conv uh, convert Ireland. Uh, Augustine, not the later more famous work, of St. Augustine of Hippo, but a different Augustine, is going to go in and convert the, uh, the English. Uh, Britain had been converted to Christianity by the Romans, and then when these uh, pagan Anglo-Saxons move in, it kind of unconverts itself because of the changes uh, sociologically that takes place. Well, Augustine's going to come back in, and now the Anglo-Saxons are going to convert to Christianity uh, as a result of this. So there's St. Patrick. His famous miracle is to drive all the snakes out of Ireland, and we often remember him in his uh, green uh, outfit uh, with this one. So the more famous St. Augustine gives us a great window into what medieval thought is, right? <clears throat> he's St. Augustine of Hippo. This is in North Africa. This is where he's born. And Augustine started out life when he was a professor. So, you know, okay, right? But he had this really profound religious experience, and he decided that he was going to make a career choice. He was going to devote his life to the church, and he was going to be much more serious about his devotion to God. Because of his intellect and his ability as an administrator and as a thinker and a writer, uh, he works his way up the ranks and becomes this bishop. But he's important to us because he wrote extensively. Now, if you're interested in uh, kind of the religious and the theological side of this, maybe more of a literary side of this, um, you can read Augustine's Confessions, and that's very interesting. You know, the church people really should take a look at some point of uh, this work. But for us, talking about especially his impact on temporal history is his work, City of God. Now, in City of God, he argues that Christians do have to follow what God wants them to do, but they still have to live in and of this world. So their relationship to secular temporal governments is important as well. So he says that secular governments under secular rulers are necessary. Why are they there? Well, the Bible says, you know, they have to enforce the laws of justice and righteousness. This is going to be a great, this is going to provide a great deal of justification to the rising kingdoms of the medieval period who are going to say, well, we've gotten more or less permission from God to uh, be over this but we don't necessarily have to be directly under the Pope, and so this is going to provide that um, leeway that they're gonna have where the Pope can say, well, we have something to do with the Christian rulers, but the Christian rulers can sort of do their own thing. Uh, this is gonna be a great line of reasoning for providing for you know, divine right of kings and state formation as we go forward with uh, the rest of world history. So this is gonna give us some different views of Augustine of Hippo, he's teaching students, he's reading, uh, he's doing works of charity, uh, and so these are his activities there. So this hopefully gives you a nice little framework of what we're talking about with the invaders of the old Roman Empire, culturally who they are, and then also to the uh, people of the, the church who kind of survived the Roman Empire and the institutions that are going to form something of a Roman bulwark or framework within the new kingdoms.